my name is Robin Davison. I'm the healthcare analyst at uh, Quoted Data. I cover um, DB Biotech, and I'm here to interview Daniel Collar, who is the, uh, the lead manager for BU Biotech and uh, uh, principal at uh, Bellevue Asset Man Management. Uh, Daniel, um, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself a little more formally and tell us about BB Biotech. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for, for having me. Um, great pleasure to give an update on BB Biotech. Um, I can start on myself. So, trained a biochemist and did a PhD in, in the biotech industry. <clears throat> then moved over to uh, the financial community as such, did a stint in investment banking, venture capital, and since actually 2004. So now 17 years ago, I joined Bellevue Asset Management um, and always worked on the mandate BB Biotech. And so I took the lead or the helm of the portfolio management team in 2010. So now 10 plus years as well, uh, responsible for, I said, the portfolio management side as well as the strategy of BB Biotech. Um, BB Biotech very quickly is... I think it's a bit unusual for your audience. It's a Swiss investment company that was founded um, back in 1993, so uh, quite some time ago. Back then, the rationale was actually a different one, or the reasoning for actually launching it was a different one. Initially, the idea was, can we introduce uh, biotech companies actually to continental European and Swiss investors? That back then uh, wasn't a fruitful proposition, so it was reverted. The investment company was founded. Um, capital was raised with institutional clients back then to, I said, invest into an innovation part or the innovation part actually of the drug industry, which is the biotech industry. And that's what we still do almost uh, three decades later. Um, I said, with the goal um, to said run a concentrated portfolio approach, which we for sure will touch on later on and have there, I said, the goal of actually achieving 15% uh, compounded returns uh, in the mid and long term cycle as such. So um, um, I said, was a very interesting um, last 17 years for me, and I'm very much looking forward as well for the next five to 10 years, because uh, the industry is absolutely exciting. What's going on the science, drug development side, as well as technology side, and obviously we have to connect with all tiers investors and, 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 and try to transport this into into uh, ultimately to obviously performance from the portfolio. Okay, well, BB Biotech is slightly unusual. Uh, well, not least in terms of its size, its uh, market cap must be greater uh, than four and a half billion uh, Swiss francs. But um, you, you also have a slightly different uh, investment approach to some of the more the, the, the other specialist in investment trusts. Let's say that the quoted data readers may be more familiar. Perhaps you could expand a little about what factors uh, differentiate your approach. Yeah, I said, I think, as always, it's obviously the, the people that make, I think, uh, here, first of all, the difference next to obviously the investment guidelines and the investment strategy. But let me quickly start. We have right now um, a board, um, actually, that's uh, of, of four gentlemen that are actually highly engaged in the overall strategy and, and long term strategy of BB Biotech. I said, a portfolio management team of seven folks, three of them working out of the East Coast, uh, the other four here with me, or we are four here over in Zurich, um, in Switzerland. I said the key or the core of what we do is actually, I said, um, try to pick early or let's say mid, small to mid cap companies actually, I said that they're early in the clinical development cycle with attractive assets um, that we think ultimately A, be competitive and make an impact on the non-med medical need, meaning they obviously support or help uh, ultimately a patient to live better or have a better quality of life as such. And that's, in short, I said, the goal we have there, a very long-term oriented investment strategy. So it's a low turnover. You mentioned already quite sizable. I said around four and a half billion US dollars that we have actively invested. Uh, we can obviously take gearing like, uh, for example, UK Trust, I think that's a huge flexibility. I said an investment guideline that we self-defined actually decades ago and we still hold true. And the core of the strategy said to follow through this S-curve strategy to invest into promising small to mid-cap companies. In general, they're listed. We can do up to 10% in private if you wanted to do so and then have their long-term uh, strategy to follow on these companies, obviously do portfolio management of them ultimately if companies are successful, they grow into more mature companies, lower growth, and then we divest them as a closed end fund, obviously can reinvest back into, you know, the next generation of companies and ideas. Right. Uh, I also, I, I mean, perhaps um, we, you could touch on the, 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 the portfolio size and the core holding nature as well. 
Yeah, so I said the size, the size of, of, of BB Biotech in terms of assets is, I said, around four and a half billion uh, US dollar right now. We use as well um, uh, smaller leverage in a sense. So we're in the mid single digit in terms of leverage. So you can say it's kind of like 4.7, almost 4.8 billion US dollar that we have invested. We have the strategy or the investment guideline to move between 20 companies at the minimum, at the maximum of 35 holdings. The main reason for that, that is obviously we want to run um, a concentrated portfolio of long-term investments. And per se, for that, we think it makes uh, most sense, actually, I said, to focus on, on, on the select portfolio. And we segment this initially according to different um, um, scopes or actually uh, categories or, or as such. One is obviously the medical need or, let's say, the disease areas, for example, the companies are working in. The other dimension is, for example, um, then the technology itself. So we have multiple layers. And I said the third dimension would be, is it, a, is it an early stage, mid stage or a late stage company, obviously on the way out. And all of this, we try to wrap a set into a concentrated book, maximum 35 a position half. They're the strategy to have so-called core holdings, meaning position are clearly north of 5%. They shall not make more than two thirds of the portfolio. So we have always between five and eight of these um, over the last decade, and then around 20 plus minus names of smaller position or, you know, earlier built position that we continue to actually build out over the years and hopefully by performance rather than obviously by active allocation. So that's plus minus or in, in short, actually um, how the portfolio construction looks like. Right. Perhaps you could um, expand a little bit how, how this has translated into the uh, the economic returns to your shareholders, obviously, has a sort of a longer term, because it's a long, a, a clear long term investor, maybe three, five, ten years, that sort of thing. Right. So I said, you know, I can depict it, I would say, even start a bit in a shorter term, because the last 12 months, obviously, been kind of like driven as well by the pandemic. And nevertheless, we've seen equity markets doing well, as I said, even ourselves. So uh, both our benchmark, we beat the benchmark, are up, you know, in the mid to high 20 percentage range share price has actually done somewhat better because we had a bit of a widening of the premium on a five-year horizon on a compounded annual basis you know in us dollar terms we make around 20 percent per annum on the 10-year it's actually even higher it's kind of like almost 28 percent meaning you know the last five years have been good but the prior five years and 10-year cycle have been even better and I said, since inception, we are in pretty spot on in, in the 15% range, actually somewhat higher for the share price, around almost 16%. The book value, I said, or the portfolio performance, 15%. That means every year since inception on a compound basis, we could beat the benchmark by around 3%. And I said, on top of the share price, doing somewhat better because we have moved the set from, from a certain um, discount situation into a premium situation over the last couple of years. So quite happy with that. I think it's a reflection of the sector um, that biotech is an innovation, high growth sector has, and we think on a forward base will offer superior return, but not to be forgotten as well, comes as well with an additional volatility. Um, and that's, I said, why we think ultimately a portfolio here makes perfect sense to reflect uh, the biotech sector for clients. Absolutely. Well, I would remind uh, clients of that when I write on the biotech. Um, one of the unusual things I've noticed while covering the company is that you you, you really only make uh, a handful of new investments a year, maybe one or two a quarter or six, eight a year, perhaps last year. I, I'm sure you have a very thorough uh, review process. But why, why don't you tell us a little bit about that investment selection process? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the core is always, I said, we have, if you want to say so, on, on, on a kind of like on, on a shorter discussion point actually one top down you and said it's the high on medical need or we call it disease area and then we flip it upside down so for example <clears throat> year to date in uh, in uh, 2021 so the first half of 2021 as we have disclosed we have done only two investments one was actually essa pharma um in the prostate cancer field uh, the other one is revolution medicine with a focus on actually kras mutated cancers pretty much um, um, of all colors such or all different cancer types that you can have the strategy there was both in a sense that we saw you know what's going on in terms of innovation which technology uh, push do we have in certain disease areas um, um, and then as well where evaluation are attractive that comes on top 
And as you heard, we always look out for next generation ideas um, or strategies. And it can tell you the prostate cancer field, we have investments there, we have others. Um, actually, there, ESA came along in a sense, understanding how the prostate cancer cycle works, meaning what are the major uh, pain points still in the system, meaning what kind of cancer mutations actually mean the current therapies don't work anymore, where is the major need? And a similar strategy and consideration was uh, behind, for example, uh, revolution medicine. And I said, we in general tend to do long-term um, due diligence cycles, meaning trying to understand the whole space, uh, all the competitors out there, the current standard of care, and then contemplate and actually review and ultimately decide what do we think makes sense for us? Asset, how do we move with that position over the next three, five, and 10 year cycle? And how this plays an important role. So this year was a bit more focused, I said, on the oncology side. If you dial back the clock, for example, 12 to 18 months, we have seen we have made a push with, um, for example, in the genetic medicines field by doing four investments. We have done more than that, but four investments, for example, in the gene editing or gene therapy field that we have dedicated reviews, even with the board of directors, say, what do we think makes sense? What is attractive? What has a big importance for us at the client, the healthcare system for the mid and long term cycle? And that's where we were, where we work for ideas. And obviously, work all the way this through to detailed financial models that we run all in house. That leads then ultimately to a portfolio decision and obviously portfolio management and review as such. Um, new points coming along like ESG and others. So I think it's a very, or we try as said, an as complete due diligence process as possible said we do only handful selection into concentrated portfolio so we want to make sure the hit rate or i said the quality of investment is hopefully as high as possible right well um there must be occasions where you have to uh sell your portfolio holdings i'm thinking here rather no, less against uh, the circumstances where you're realizing um, a, a successful investment but where uh it, it, and as is the nature of biotech um, the investment case has changed or deviated in some way. Um, I'm sure that's something you have to think about. Um, can you tell us about these, um, these sort of circumstances, what you do there? Yes, so I said there are multiple reasons how a position exits. Obviously, the luxury one is a takeover or I said share price runs so high that you, know, you obviously can take profits. You're very happy where, where the position has moved to. What you described then as well, I would say, and that's at the core of what I said we try to avoid or obviously optimize such in terms of as deep understanding of the drug modality, the disease areas, the clinical trial risk, et cetera. If something fails, let's say on the biology or clinical side, or even to the regulatory side, intellectual property, whatever it is, if there is a fundamental break in the investment hypothesis, uh, then obviously we sell. And we have had that and will have that because I said it's an inherent risk actually to do drug development. I mean, as you know, the large majority of projects will ultimately fail. Um, and you have to dissect and try to understand uh, different areas. So small molecule in, for example, psychiatry disease is very risky. You will only very late know if something works or not. Genetic therapies, on the other hand, you can go rather earlier. It's probably more on the safety side. So we, we have to apply uh, different uh, methodologies. But it, I would say the easy one is a clinical trial fails. I mean, fails just totally. That means for us, the investment hypothesis is broken. Regulatory interaction fails and company have to repeat. That will drive the decision. Is it worthwhile to hold or not or to sell? And the a difficult one as such is actually, will the commercial model ultimately play out or not? Because that takes an often a bit more patient. And uh, that can be a bit more agonizing and painful in terms of you see the result of if you have been right or wrong rather late meaning that's opportunity cost um, um, and as such. And I think that's the, the major buckets of failure that I could describe that then lead to obviously a, a clean or clear cut uh, divestment decision. Okay. Well, I'm sure it's, a, it's important discipline uh, to, to maintain uh, your, your good returns to have to consider that. Oh, I, I think some of this, one of those sort of things which a lot of um, biotech fund managers always complain about now is the fact that uh, even if you just looked at the US, there must be a thousand listed biotech companies in the small mid space that could be in your potential investment universe. Uh, I mean, how on earth do you monitor that many and, and, yep. and, and screen them for investment opportunities? What, what's your sort of practice and how, how do you go about it? Yeah, so I said, you know, we 
obviously uh, we we fully agree with what did you said or the challenge as such that it's it's actually large and i would add there equally as much companies actually in i would not even call it late stage private anymore but on the private side that contemplate what to do because there's abundant amount of capital these uh, these these days and quarters and years in, in the venture side so you look not just on the public side but actually what's going on behind the curtain on the private side as well if you want to understand uh, i said the disease area or or um, the competitive situation um, that you think will have an impact next couple of years as such so that's very broad. I said we we weed out some of that by at least on a corporate level by actually not looking at the large caps per se as an investment candidate anymore. But they would actually flip it around and say, I told you we have disease areas that we look at. And within the disease areas, we'll look at which are the innovative drugs that we think play a major role. And that's for us the major trigger. So we don't try to dissect and stay on top of what all the companies do on a very regular basis, that uh, even with a team of seven, it's very tough to do. I would say we filter mostly by actually the innovation degree and actually the clinical data, and then only flicking around says, okay, that's a great asset, big pharma, we don't care because it will never be investment scope. So we seek out actually interesting assets that then fit into the category or they're ideally sitting in smaller mid cap companies, because that ultimately can lead to, to an investment candidate for us. And as I said, there we have a team of seven. So we have dissected or actually um, um, cut the areas into different groups within the team. The same is on the technology front, so that individual folks are actually responsible then to cover a more narrow space and the more narrow part actually of the industry. And they're not just responsible for what's within the portfolio, but actually what else is going on out there? What have we missed? both on the positive and on the negative side. I think that's very important for us then because that's the only way to improve the investment process. Why don't we turn to the uh, the wider biotechnology uh, sector and the stock market, let's say. I mean, I've been describing this for some time as being volatile. I mean, I think this is, I mean here, volatile even by biotech standards and norms. Um, obviously we've had the pandemic and last year we had a very strong run up in the second half of the year, which sort of peaked in February, but uh, this year, and then there's been quite a quite a strong sell-off uh, amongst many of the small and mid-cap uh, companies since then. Although, having said that, th there's latterly been uh, a reversal with with some evidence of industry M&A going on. I mean, I just was wondering what your take is on the current va valuation of the market. Uh, and, and potentially, their, I said their prospects going forward. Yeah. So we hear different things, and I think you know. I would dissect the biotech market because biotech is not the biotech per se. It's 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 a very heterogeneous market per se. So it's not like a universe like large cap pharma that are, let's say, obviously one company does better than the other, or grows a bit faster, but they are easily, you know, put together as a peer group and compared to each other. In biotech, you have everything from I call them the evergreens like Gilead and the Anchins of the world that we think actually still trade at, at low multiples, but as I said, have growth issues and, and pipeline issues, all the way down to smaller cap or earlier stage companies that can sometimes be, you know, billions, loss making for years to come, nevertheless with very strong balance sheets. So you have to look at every company on an individual level. That's what I try uh, to, to go to in terms of uh, portfolio discussion, for example, right now, after years and years of, MA, for example, in the space of target oncology or oncology place, we have seen now, um, I mean, still one or the other deal, but actually MA in general has not been a driver this year for performance. I think it was, if not the quiet, the most quiet year the last decade in terms of MA. I think Q2 was mentioned even as probably the lowest, uh, even for a longer period than that. So we still have seen the consumption of, of AstraZeneca acquiring Alexion, that deal has gone through in summer. We have seen a handful of small individual deals, but this has not been a driver of performance. We have seen in the sector, large cap do well, as we have seen it in broader markets, being it either defensive against interest rate cycles, you know, that that's probably the safe haven play to go. And we've seen small mid cap biotech actually being in a very tough spot. So a large degree of small mid cap companies year to day, 2021 are down 30, 50, sometimes 60 or 70%, which, you know, is an interesting observation. We see it as well as an interesting opportunity. And that's why I said we took profits in the large cap 
slash uh, in the COVID names, like for example, in our case, Moderna, and reallocated uh, more capital into small mid cap space because we see there a substantial undervaluation or we call it better and more positive substantial upside potential for the next coming years to come. So m and this year has not played a role. Um, and I said, you have to look at the sector or actually dissect the sector into subgroups because they have behaved extremely diff different in, in 2021. So I have hardly seen a more dispersed performance yet in my longer career than what we have seen in 2020 and in 2021. Well, you mentioned this earlier, but um, I think uh, it, it, you're distinguished by your bias towards investing in companies developing some of the new technology. You mentioned uh, gene editing, gene uh, gene therapy at the moment. Yep. I wonder if you just wanted to summarize briefly what your uh, approach is, uh, and maybe you could mention some of the new areas you might be looking at at the moment, maybe you know, for future investors perhaps. Yeah. So I said, you know, gene gene therapy, gene editing. I would say, as I said, has turned into a big topic, even uh, to some degree, there was some, some overheat discussion in the second half of 2020, the Nobel laureate was obviously awarded to, to gene editing as such. Why did we look at gene therapy and gene editing? Is because if you look at biotech, you start often as well to look at, for example, orphan diseases, meaning genetically driven underlying diseases. So at birth, you have a defect in, in your genetic makeup and that ultimately leads either as a, as, as a newborn already or the later onset uh, to severe disorders. That's where the industry has played a big part or a big role the last uh, decades. And in the past, we tried to compensate by, I said, using small molecules or protein-based or antibodies to try to cope and obviously lead to um, a better life or a better situation for the patient. So if you think of it to have a long-lasting effect, you want to impact the genetic makeup of these cells or the organ or the entire patient as such. And there you have two options. One I said is gene therapy, meaning trying to replace or actually add a healthy gene. Gene editing is then one step further that you actually actually change something in the backbone of the genetic material of the patient. So these technologies are around for quite some time. The question is, what was the trigger for us to invest in that was actually the applicability not just to work as a scientist in the lab, but actually make a product out of it that ultimately serves the patient. That sometimes can be a lengthy process. And here we have seen the industry accelerate. And that was for us, for example, the reason to invest there. We have had other such cycles and big cycles. Um, for example, the RNA space, the intermittent long acting therapies. We started off by the blocking strategies, meaning the protein production shall be lower, such as antisense with ionis or uh, siRNA with all nylon. That was the initial trigger as well to look, for example, in the opposite, I call it a gain of function or to produce something with genetic information at an intermittent level. And that led us to Moderna or the messenger RNA field. So these technology iteration that we see as we watch them, we think we step in when we see certain proof of concept, meaning these technologies are now applicable to patient and in early clinical setting. And that's when BB Bita gets involved and starts to take invest mistakes in, in such companies. Right. Okay. Um, let's uh, well, let's turn to one of those, which is certainly perhaps a, a, a new approach for you, um, uh, maybe three years ago, but has been uh, very prominent this year. Of course, this is Moderna, uh, one of the, the producers of the uh, COVID vaccine. Um, it, it's actually had a spectacular performance, uh, well, over two years, but certainly even this year, where it's up probably 150, 60 percent. Something like that. I mean, what's your view on this stock at the moment? And so, how long can it be, you know, co-holding? Obviously, it's your largest holding, or it was your largest holding at the at the, at the last uh, report. Yeah. yeah. So, I said Moderna, and we announced that as well that we, uh, on the run-up, I said have 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 uh, shaved the position in the sense that we took some profits, and uh, because I said we want to keep as well a certain risk metric or a portfolio management um, consideration. That we say, okay, if the position runs massively of about 15%, for example, in the portfolio, we start to, to trim the position, take profits, as much as we are convinced actually of obviously um, uh, the positive situation that Moderna is in. But let me start, I said earlier off, I, I briefly described that. So Moderna came into view, we had multiple interaction with the company management team and um, said, okay, the concept is clear. We know about mRNA, obviously, from, from our um, educational days at the university all the way through. The question is, how can you? generate or how can you turn it into drug modality 
And that I think is the beauty of actually what Moderna does. Um, it uses said uh, this, sim I call it simplistic, obviously it's a high tech company, but how you, with four letter codes in the messenger RNA in different lengths, um, you actually deliver different information to our body or our cells to produce a said functional protein. And at the same time, also the company work as well on the delivery side of things. So how to optimize delivery into organ or stability or repeat dosing, et cetera. So they all brought this very nicely together. And we saw the culmination of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, project or now the spike vax as it's called. But the company has worked for many, many years on technology and other you know, uh, prophylactic vaccines in the past. And only that allowed them actually to deploy the technology as such. So right now, as you rightly point out, the valuation has gone steep um, the main challenge even for us is uh, it's trickier to actually judge how much of the valuation is attributed just to purely SARS-CoV-2 so the corona pandemic and actually all the vaccine sales they do now with spike vaccine and the booster shot but we think we have a good visibility at least for 2021 as well as 2022 and now we see more and more countries and governments actually start to buy into 23 and 24 being in stockpile or, or pre-orders the beauty of the technology or actually of Moderna for us now is, if you think of it, they're financed through, they're highly profitable, have a very strong balance sheet. They have manufacturing capacity ramped up globally that they will never probably exceed or hopefully not exceed again, because that would require another pandemic to hit that's even more complicated to handle. Um, I think all the regulators on the global scale um, have actually accepted now that mRNA is a good technology that offers a lot of value and benefit for patients. And last but not least, it's a brand. So we think as well in the future, if you think about other vaccines like influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, et cetera, um, that A, the same technology is very easily applicable. Obviously, everything has clinical challenge and, and you have to prove it differently. But that's the big opportunity for Moderna now um, to actually capture on this opportunity that came through the pandemic and transform that actually into a great long-term business model. And we think they're a long way on that trajectory already. And we will see that in 23, 24, when hopefully, I said, influenza and RSV and other vaccines uh, start to hit the market. And that will be a sustainable business and a long-term business um, that we think is highly successful and highly scalable as such not even mentioning all the other dimensions that the company is trying to tackle. So a great investment case. There will be some volatility at these price points, no question. But as I said, for us, I think it's, it's a perfect example to pick early on a winner on the technology. And then as I said, have the bravery to hold through and, and have the position grow very sizable as such, although we took profits uh, given just the sheer size and on the portfolio side. Cool. Another standout performer this year for BB Biotech has been Biogen, which is perhaps a little bit surprising because that would probably fall, Biogen would fall outside of your small mid range. And um, anyway, readers of a bit of the stories I put on the Crunch Data will know that uh, you, you took a, what I considered a non consensus view yep. after the, um, the FDA advisory committee voted very heavily against the approval of Aduhelm and, and, and Alzheimer's. And yet the the US agency it did approve the drug, it controversially may be, but uh, yeah. you have certainly profited from that. Um, I, I wanted to, maybe you could summarize the story there, but perhaps I did, but um, you know, is this going to be a long-term holding uh, given it falls outside your normal hunting ground? Yeah, no, I said, you're absolutely right. So it falls outside normal hunting ground, just for sheer that it's obviously a, an evergreen biotech, um, you know, um, 30, 40 billion mark cap prior to obviously the FDA ultimate decision. Um, so in general, we would, you know, deviate from that as a new investment per se. But the reason for that was said was strategic. Um, we said FDA is so much on the positive side and so much willing, let's say, to actually approve a product that shows a certain merit. Um, I would say that was the major driver for us, I said, to take a strategic position because the, the drug data itself for us was good, but not would not have been good enough according to our internal sense just take an investment on, on that one i said bajan is now in the portfolio since the approval um uh, we trimmed a little bit in terms of when the spike happened post the fda decision because I said quite a few people were were obviously surprised by that um right now the discussion for the company is much more what to do next so i said we know the multiple sclerosis franchise is under pressure um up 
will have a difficult launch um, in terms of the pricing, the modality, and how you roll it out, as well as competition in the future, for sure. But they have a couple of, we think, interesting data point readouts um, and decisions that are due. One, for example, older, very small patient population, that's the, the, the ALS patient with a SALT1 mutation. That's going to hit the next couple of weeks in terms of phase three readout. will have implication for our other larger holding called Ionis. Um, Techfidara IP set, et cetera. So that, that's more a bit plus or minus at what level um, um, do we take profits. But the way we discuss it now internally, it doesn't look like it turns into the classical five and 10 year long term, but it could evolve into that. So that's still, to be fair, a debate. Um, but right now we'll hold out for the next two, three um, events and milestones that are due in the next couple of weeks. And then we'll take a decision once that happened um, on, on with a fresh you know, collection of actually data that we have by then. But that's absolutely great. Strategic of the classical, you know, investment or the Nova investment strategy. We had badge in the long past, and that was around Tysabri launch, etc. cetera. Um, so it was always obviously a big name in the biotech industry and for biotech fund managers. But I said, you know, that was a strategic move. All right. You mentioned Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals a couple of times. This has been, um, a long-term core holding, in fact, I think your largest holding in the past at times. Um, yeah. You're certainly one of the most consistent supporters of this company, which I perhaps unfairly described as somewhat unloved by this, by the the, the sort of wider US uh, sort of buy side, uh, buy side, buy side, if you like. Um, this company seems to be actually approaching a number of um, clinical trial readouts in the, the, the next few months. What, what's your sort of view on this one now? Yeah, I think there are there are you know you could say they self maneuver themselves kind of like a bit into a tough spot uh, to say the least. Um, one thing was I said they launched and I said we invest ten years plus minus ago it was a very successful initial investment stock run up massively had a great success together with its um, marketing development partner Bajan for spin Raza in the spinal muscle atrophy world or patient population. Then got competition by gene therapy, then got competition by small molecule um, drugs from others. Um, was called out, it's dead, it's dead, it's dead, it's still not dead. We still think it's it's one of the mainstay um, actually as, as therapy in the field. And they don't stop here. So they had a couple of failures. One was actually a high profile failure, but as well a high risk strategy that they had developed and actually Roche actually then did run the clinical trials and actually run the program in Huntington's disease that unfortunately failed both from the patient uh, perspective as well as obviously from us as an investor and that put them always to some degree in a tough spot on one hand you have the siRNA field with onyl meaning other mRNA um, blocking or or, or uh, destructing agents that that actually I said have the ultimate goal to lower protein production. On the other hand, you have then the long-term curative approach like gene therapy or gene editing. So where do they fit into this? And we think Ionis is now on the way to get out of or under the carpet or from under the carpet out, out of that again in situation, both in terms of have made substantial progress on the platform itself. So further generation, iteration of the technology and the backbone and the chemistry. And we think now it requires another uh, couple of months of patience because they have multiple readouts. I said the lead one or the next one just will be sold one. That's the next couple of weeks with Biogen. And then from then on, it will be a continuous actually rollout of both phase three registrational data being in-house with the next generation TTR blocker. Or then later on in 23, 24 with Novartis, and Pfizer and Bayer and other companies uh, that have actually big, big trials running in big indications. So we think that's actually worth it. And that's, for example, I said a company where it's tough um, in a sense they started off focusing on orphan and ultra orphan small indication and now the technology we think is ripe actually for larger indication and you know they still have a couple of big deals and partnerships and we have hoped that they have finally changed to retain some of these assets it will take some time but we're still optimistic that ultimately this pays off and that we will see uh, better years ahead both in terms of obviously clinical trial results that ultimately translates into better performance for, for us as investors. Of course. Right, well, just to sort of conclude, I, I, it occurred to me that, I mean, BB Biotech has really owned, uh, about 35 holdings at the moment, which is actually the high in, in, within your, your range. You've held many of those for uh, 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 quite a few years, many years in, in some cases. 
uh, and you only add a, a few and maybe take out a few every year. It, it, it's it might sound flippant, but do you do you have favourites amongst these, or do you have to try and uh, guard against that happening? Uh, you know, in case it uh, you lose your the, the, the purposes of your investment. Yeah, no, I, I think a favourite is is it's always uh, you know a big thing, and you always have to be tempted not to be biased by the short term performance because that's often then very convenient to say that's the winner. I like actually the overall portfolio, and and it obviously sounds a bit like a marketing pitch, but I like it from. For, for a specific reason, A, we think asset biotech is risky and it requires a balance. And we think asset with the tilt just to be highly, highly um, geared towards small mid cap, where you have a big leverage or a lever actually for success being above the clinical regulatory, but as well on the commercial side. We think there are actually many interesting plays in there. So I would shy away of giving you a single name. I said Moderna is the easy one right now because I said it's just sheerly impressive. And obviously, we are all, um, I would say as well, proud that we have given the company capital back in 2018 when the company was private to actually say, develop the technology to develop or use the capital to develop um, um, prophylactic vaccines. And how they have translated this in such a short period of time as small company back then, they are now growing quite substantially. Is just nothing else than impressive. So I think that's what makes us proud, that what makes us excited about the industry and we think that's a prime example. And we think there are many more in the portfolio that, that uh, will go that route. So very much looking forward. Well, I think it must be very difficult um, to, to do it, pick anything other than Moderna. I think I calculated that you'd uh, uh, say something like a 20-fold return over sort of maybe three years since investing in a, as a, a, a private company. Well, that's a, a good point to conclude. Um, uh, I, I just want to thank you, Daniel, for your time. I hope this has been of benefit to our, our readers, uh, potential investors and investors in, in BB Biotech. Certainly, I would recommend anybody uh, uh, go to the BB Biotech website. Um, they have very good uh, disclosure on their very, very professional IR team as well. Uh, and if you want any, any of uh, our uh, commentary, you can go to quotedata.com. So with that, I'd like to thank you again, Daniel. I think that's been very helpful. Thank you very much for having me again. Thank you.